let's get started with the topic for today's lesson, basic visual design principles for charts and graphs. A lot of the work you'll be doing on your visualizations will come in the refinement stage. Unfortunately, many of the tools out there still don't follow readability or legibility principles. So the objective of this lesson is to understand and identify the chart features that help communicate and hinder communication to your audience. If you've heard of Edward Tufte, then you're familiar with those design elements that can hinder clarity, readability, and interpretation of data visualizations. If not, study his text, The Visual Design of Quantitative Information. So let's begin. Let's test ourselves and go through an exercise in identifying those visual displays that help and those that hinder. So take a look at these two graphs. Which graph makes it easier to determine whether mid-cap U.S. stock or small-cap U.S. stock has a greater share? The pie chart or the bar graph? If you guess the bar graph, you're correct. But why? Well, studies have found that it's more difficult for people to judge differences in area, such as slices of a pie, than it is for them to judge differences in length, such as length of the bars. Let's look at another example. Which of these line graphs is easier to read? The 2D line graph or the 3D line graph? If you guess the 2D line graph, you're correct. Making objects in a graph appear 3D adds no value in, and usually makes the values harder to read and compare, as you see in this example. Next, which of these two tables is easier to read? Table A or Table B? If you guess Table B, you're correct. But why? Well, the grid, the fill colors, the unnecessary precision, and the redundant use of dollar signs in the top table all distract from the data that make it unnecessarily difficult to read and compare values. Which graph makes it easier to focus on the pattern of change through time instead of the individual values? When you're looking to compare data over time, line graphs always work best. So bars work for comparing differences in magnitude, but when you need to see a shape of change over time, nothing is more effective than a line graph. So which graph presents the data accurately? Graph A or graph B? Well, if you remember from earlier, because the bars start at 2,000 instead of zero, their respective height differences have been greatly exaggerated. Which map makes it easier to find all the countries with positive growth rates? If you guess option A, you're correct. To use map B, you'll be required to memorize the meanings of seven colors, which exceeds the limits of short-term memory, or constantly refer to the legend. With map A, you can remember the meaning of red and blue, and the rest is intuitive. Let's look at another example. Which graph makes it easier to determine R&D's travel expenses? The 3D effects make graphs hard to read and can hide the values altogether. The small multiples display allow for easy comparison of all the bars. In which graph are the labels easier to read? Graph A or graph B? Hopefully you can tell that graph A was much easier to read. Vertically oriented or angled text is much harder to read than horizontally oriented text. Which graph is easier to look at? Graph A or graph B? Bright colors are great for making important things stand out, but when they're overused, nothing stands out and becomes more difficult to focus on the data. Which table allows you to see the areas of poor performance more quickly? Table A or table B? Well, this is the same principle as earlier. Overuse of color is distracting. Additionally, when everything is colored, the important things don't jump out like they should. So now that you've tested yourself, how'd you do? Well, I thought it'd be great if we can review those principles that were employed on the good examples that we just saw. The principles that we're going to discuss have unique names like chart junk, data ink ratio, data integrity, data richness, scales, color, and attribution. So let's start with the first principle. It's called chart junk. So chart junk is that useless, non-informative, or information-obscuring elements of qualitative information displays. 
So in this example, we're looking at a line graph, and the chart junk here would include removal of the grid lines. It would also include the removal of the frame around the visual. Look to see if tick marks are necessary. If they're not, remove them. When we're looking at tables, consider removing the grid lines for readability. The next principle I'd like to introduce you to is called data ink ratio. The objective here is to remove the amount of ink used to represent the data. In this chart, too many bars represent a single data point. So for instance, if you look at the first value on the x-axis, you'll notice that it's 0.18. And there are five bars to represent the first value, when you only really need one. Next, you probably want to consider your bin size, and that's actually the width of the bars. Is it really necessary for the bars to be as wide as they are? Another option is to use an area chart as opposed to a bar chart, if your objective here is to show a trend. And to simplify it, you could also use a line chart. The next principle that I like to introduce you to has to do with data integrity. It's called the lie factor. What's the lie factor? The lie factor is size the effect in a graphic or a chart over the actual size of the effect in the data change. So let's look at an example and see if we can understand really what the lie factor means. So this is an example that you probably saw in the Edward Tufte book that you're reading for this course. It's a graph from the New York Times and it shows the mandated fuel economy standard set by the U.S. Department of Transportation. The standard required an increase in mileage from 18 to 27.5. And that increase is 53%. However, in the graph, the magnitude of the increase shown is actually 783% for a whopping lie factor of 14.8. The lie factor essentially should be zero. A way to represent the data most accurately could be to use a stacked area chart. So here's a ridiculous example of a pie chart. Now we know that when we have too many slices or too many data points that we want to represent in a pie chart, it makes it illegible, unreadable. So here we're trying to show different proportions of sales over four quarters. We'll add some data labels here. See if you can tell what's wrong with this picture. Well, if you've noticed that the values don't add up to one or 100%, so you may want to convert actual values to percentages. But what else is still wrong? Well, we're using a pie chart to show sales over some dimension of time, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter. A basic tenet of data visualization is that when we want to show values over time, we typically show those in a line graph. So here's a better way to show the sales over time. The next principle I'd like to introduce you to is data richness. Rich data means quality data, accurate data from reputable sources, plus effective filtering of that data for the audience. Think about if we can tell the whole story with an excerpt. Or do we need to show the entire data set? It's important not to be misleading. So here's an example where we probably would want to show the changes over time from 2012 to 2013. Data quality doesn't necessarily mean data richness. Plotting a lot of data points is not necessarily better. Let's look at this example. Here you can see that the trend is inconclusive. It's not an upward trend, it's not a downward trend. So what story are we trying to tell with this graph? A series of data points is meaningful and significant if it indicates a change from the baseline pattern. Here's an example that represents an upward trend. If this was our data, this would be something that we want to represent in a graph. The former graph doesn't communicate a clear message. Color. We want to minimize the use of color, as we saw in the earlier quiz. We want to try to use shading instead from lightest to dark darkness, avoid zebra patterns, and consider using red for negative earnings. Be aware, some people are colorblind. And finally, it's really important to explain your encoding. The design of every graph has a similar flow. You get the data, encode it with circles, bars, colors, and then you let others read it. The readers have to decode your encodings at this point. You have to describe what the circles, bars, and colors represent. Label directly on the data instead of or in addition to using a legend. And finally, make sure you cite your data source. For further study on good design principles, check out these three resources from Edward Tufte.